All right. Oh, I thought I was ready. What am I thinking? All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City uh, Council Candidate Forum sponsored by the Greater Ketchikan Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Trevor Shaw. I have the honor of serving as the president of the, uh, the chamber. And so we'd just like to welcome all of you, as well as our eight candidates. We have everybody here in person. And so let's go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and then I'll run through the format of our forum. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, and thank you to uh, Cape Fox Lodge for allowing us to do these events here, and to our friends over at uh, KPU Telecom for live streaming and uh, airing this on channel 675. Um, and uh, thank you for all of those who could be here, and to the Catch Can Daily News for their coverage as well. And uh, so with um, the general format, we'll do opening statements of one minute apiece, followed by a variety of questions. Since we have eight candidates running, and in the interest of time, we're going to do something that we haven't done at the previous, uh, at the previous forums that I like to call candidate speed dating. We're going to ask a series of yes or no questions, and very simple. You just give a yes or no answer down across the table. And uh, then we will, uh, if time allows, also give candidates a one-minute closing statement each as well. And uh, our lovely... Uh, Timer, Carolyn Henry, who sits on our board, is sitting up front. She will give you the 30 second, 15 second, and time mark. All questions, unless stated otherwise, will be a minute apiece. And so we'll just go right on down the table to get us uh, started with opening statements. Miss Zingy. Hello, my name is Judy Zingy. I'm a wife and mother and a dedicated public servant. I run the Plaza Mall. Um, and in addition to that, I also own a company called SEAC Professional Services, and we service the legal community. Um, I've lived here 20 plus years. I've served on the council for, I served on the council for nine years, and uh, took a year off, a well needed year off, just to regain my perspective. Um, and now I'm back running, so I would appreciate your vote. Hello, my name is Bronson Olson, and I'm running for city council again. I ran in 2021 as a writing candidate, and this year I'm running officially on the ballot. So uh, with that, my main goal uh, that I want to run for city council is to do everything in my power to better the lives of the community members. So if that be working more closely with nonprofits, working more closely with the borough, and collaborating on issues that are going to improve the quality of life for not just the city of Ketchikan, but all of the community members of Ravilla. Uh, I really uh, want to make that my main goal. Good evening, I'm Riley Gass, also running for the seat, uh, finishing up my first three year term. And the reason I wanna run is, I feel like I bring a different perspective to the council that maybe there's a little bit of a lacking outside perspective between uh, those who are elected and a lot of the citizens whom they represent. I'm about 5,000 hours through an 8,000 hour apprenticeship to become an electrician. So every day I'm in job sites, construction sites, out in the community working with folks. And I get to hear from a lot of people who um, just kind of average everyday hard work in Ketchikan residents who feel like there's just a disconnect. Um, kind of the thing I'm biggest on is getting our budget under control. I think we have a bit of a spending problem at the city. We are, uh, we've got a bad habit of spending what I think is an uh, irresponsible amount, so I'd really like to focus on that. And uh, before I run out of time, I'm a lifelong resident with a new baby and one on the way, so I'm fully vested in uh, the long haul for Ketchikan. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Yep. Kevin Kristovich, I'm seeking a three-year term. Is this working? It is. Okay. Use your outside uh, voice. Ran, I ran last year. I came in really close by 33 votes. Why am I running? Because a lot of people with the same concerns that I have have approached me and figured that I would be a good choice to get in here and try and clean up the mess that we're dealing with. We have 
Homeless is on the rise. In three years, I've seen it increase. We have to, we have to deal with that. We have to come up with a solution. Um, the, a lot of other things. Uh, affordable housing. I've witnessed you know, people losing their homes. And we talked about this last year, so we have to address that, try and come up with a solution. And the increasing population of tourists that we will be having, they're growing all the time. So we have public safety issues. And amongst other things, we just don't want to be taxed anymore. Let's take care of the debt that we have on our books and try and get it cleared up before we take on any more debt. And I'm open to any questions later. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Rob Arnold. I'd like to talk about someone else. I want to talk about the 175 uh, miners, lumberjacks, merchants, and laborers that in the First World War from Ketchikan decided to go and give their lives, 175. After the war, about half of them came back to Ketchikan. And during the time, this is when the American Legion was founded. So in July 1919, the founders in town decided to pledge to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, to, be, to stand for martial law and order, to foster and perpetuate 100% Americanism, to preserve the memories and instance of the Great World War. And their fifth responsibility is to inoculate a sense of individual obligation to the community, state, and nation. So that's why I'm running. I feel it's my duty, like these that went before me, to stand up for our town in whatever I can do. It's tied to the last claw of the Declaration of Independence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other in our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So it's a sacred honor that I'm here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jack Finnegan. I'm just now completing a one-year term on the Ketchikan City Council and asking for your vote for a three-year term. I've been lucky in the 11 years that I've lived here not only to find my wife and my house and to start a family. I'm also starting a business. I work in the arts here. I work in cruise ship tourism. I've worked with various nonprofits here in town and I've worked in our education system for many of the 11 years that I've lived in Ketchikan. And I think by virtue of that, I have a really diverse perspective on some of the many issues and challenges that face our community. I'm also uh, a person who prides himself on taking in the views of all people, even if they don't agree with me, if they don't see with me eye to eye. I'm not going to throw your argument out just because we don't have the same perspective on something. I want to hear what you think and why, and to see if we can't find some middle ground so that we can put our best foot forward for Ketchikan's future. I've also been really pleased to be part of the discussion about Delilah Walsh's long-term strategic plan. We've identified our uh, values and our priorities. I'd like to be part of that ongoing conversation into the next three years. Thank you. Abby Bradbury, I'm uh, seeking re-election for another three-year term. Um, just completed my first one, learned a lot, still learning quite a bit as well. Um, I, I wanna thank the community for uh, voting for me three years ago and asking me to uh, be represent them at the table. Um, and I hope to continue doing that for another three years. I manage a tourism company here in town, so I am involved in that side, and I do realize that we do have problems within that industry that need to fix, need to be fixed to better our community and the quality of life for our citizens. So um, I'm definitely very eager to continue to help with that project. Um, I am also one that asks the hard questions, even if they're unpopular, and continue to uh, make sure that both sides are heard at the table uh, when we're doing discussions. And I've also proven my commitment. I go to every single council meeting. I go to every event that I'm appointed to or there to represent the citizens. It's important to make sure that we are heard um, at all the time, no matter where it is, if it's at uh, state level, federal level, or other communities. Good evening, my name is Brian Buckman. I'm running for city council. I enjoy camping, skiing. I'm a 23 year Alaska resident, moved to be trained here in Juneau about nine years ago, and for the last four solidly here. For the last three years, I've been working on homeless advocacy here in town with having amazing, amazing results, working with dozens of business owners and getting the word out there that what is needed as our responsibility and treating the matters as if the time for talk, theory, and hoping people change has passed and we've run out of time and we need effective government to be able to 
get these people facilitated, and by, it's a win-win by protecting the business owners, protecting the residents, and protecting our visitors that we rely on for our economy. Thank you. Uh, and also, if I'd like to say as well, I'm interested to work seriously with anybody on this matter. And this is my new chosen career, and I have much time and energy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and if we could pass the mic back down here, we'll start the next question with uh, Mr. Olson, and we'll just try to work our way down the table. And um, again, with uh, as many candidates as we have, when you see the time uh, uh, sign pop up, in the future, I'll start interrupting you. I don't like to do that. So if you can please close your remarks as soon as you can after the time sign pops up. So our next question, one minute. Uh, if there was any one item or issue you could tackle or solve during a three-year three council term other than funding limitations, what would it be? So if I had one project to choose, it would probably be it's on everybody's docket of things to do, would be housing, of course. Um, not just available housing, but affordable housing. We could build 100 houses that are $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, but if people don't have the funds to buy those houses, then what's the point of building 100 more houses? So if we're building houses, we have to make sure that they're affordable. Uh, I think that the city and borough should work in collaboration to build another apartment complex, you know? And with that, if it was under city or borough control, then they could definitely subsidize the rent or control the rent to make it cheaper or affordable for people to actually live there. I know the borough has $7 million set aside for these projects in the borough, but uh, something more downtown or in the city limits would be ideal. So I think a collaboration between both municipalities would be a, a great pr uh, triumph. Yep, please feel free to pass along. Okay, so my number one issue would be uh, moving forward with a sustainable budget. And the reason for that is I think there are many ideas out there of what we, we as a city could or should be doing or increased things we could do. But the fact of the matter is we can't afford our current state of government right now. And so while it's not a real sexy issue to talk about uh, the budget, I think it's the, of the utmost importance. Um, when people can't afford groceries and shipping costs and rent or their mortgage, when we add on additional taxation, it makes it that much harder for them. So I'm in favor of the government stepping out of the way. Uh, one thing I was able to do last year, we had a proposal to increase the property tax. I kind of took that by the horns and um, explained why I thought it was unnecessary. And in the end, we ended up voting that down. So it, that was one small example of uh, how we did that. So just getting a budget that the people can afford. Thank you. Mr. Krisovich. Can you ask the question one more time? Please? Yes, during a three-year council term, uh, other than funding limitations, what one item or issue would you tackle? If it could be anything. Affordable housing. Uh, three year, if in three years, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, they've been squeezed out of their apartments. Um, they've lived there. X amount of years, both both parties are working, bringing in a steady income, pay the rent on time. Have a guy ask me, you know, any rentals available? They get squeezed out. They have like five days to move out of their house. So to me, that's not right. I have some ideas for affordable housing. It's uh, to be. It's going to get looked into. I'm not willing to share anything until after the election. But if if we don't make it by the strike of lightning, but uh, I will pass it on. But there, I do have a plan, I have an idea, and uh, I have location and people to meet with. And I think it could be done. You just have to meet with the right people. And um, instead of houses, you could do like a uh, apartment, one or two bedroom um, condominium style complex, ADA compliant. So affordable housing is one, but if we had more than one choice, I'd add a few more. Thank you. Mr. Arnold. Yes, uh, immediately we need to fix the roads. We need to fill the potholes up. Uh, I think that that needs to be happening right away. And leading into that is a tourism strategy so we can somehow regulate and maybe time these buses so that there's uh, a, a pattern flow. And I think it comes from a tourism strategy. 
the uh, the city likes to hire new personnel. Their the wages. I, I was just looking at the budget, and the wages are just going up huge. I wish I could get a raise like that out in the ferries, uh, all all across the departments. And then they want to add a housing director, which I think is ill advised. Uh, we have issues with too much spending and not enough spending on the right things. I feel that uh, the roads need to happen, and we can't do it within the next five years. We need to do it now. Um, and thank you. Mr. Finnegan. I certainly understand the pressure surrounding housing, and I know it has an impact on everything from quality of life to affordability to even the homeless and houseless issue that we've got here in town. But with respect to the next three years, what I really think, you know, like Mr. Gass's uh, no notion, this, this might not be the most electrifying, but I, I really want to take a closer look at how we can better plan for infrastructure spending. So often over the past several years, we've delayed or deferred maintenance, usually because we don't have the funds available, but a lot of these repairs are necessary. A lot of them are inevitable. And I know City Manager Walsh has uh, a long-term plan, a strategic plan in development. It's again, it's something that I'd like to be part of in having that conversation because these are costs that we cannot avoid. And if we're reactive, you know, when they, when they emerge as crises, it's never as convenient, it's never as economical, it's never as efficient when we have to fix the problem today. So if we can set schedules and plans in advance for repairs that we know are coming down the road, we put the city in a bet, in a, in a, on a better path for the future. And I'd like to be part of that conversation. These are all great topics. Uh, they're all super important. But to complete any of these, we need staff to uh, to be there to complete those. So um, something that we've been talking about uh, over the last three years, and I think it's more vital now than ever, is our employee retention and satisfaction for KPU and the city. Um, we need these employees, like I mentioned earlier, to complete these tasks. We can say all these awesome ideas, um, plan for all of these things, but if we do not have boots on the ground, it is never going to get completed. So we need to start at the bottom. We need to get that under control. We have a mass exodus because other people are paying more, have better benefits, have housing available. Um, and once we get that stabilized, then definitely tackle these other problems. Infrastructure is right there behind it as uh, important in our community, especially along the water line and the wastewater. So uh, employees definitely, uh, we need to really focus on that and continue to improve that uh, for them. Thank you. When I'm elected, I would like to form a committee to look into the societal problems of our local homeless people so that we could really start to get to the root of their personal problems, case by case basis, with overlooking, week by week, or, or anything. We really need to address these issues now and act now into the future. And it, we are not a huge big city like Anchorage or Fairbanks. This is not going to take years. And I firmly believe it could take less than three. So I would like to really say that it is a time where this is a change in the city now for the city's future. And supposedly, we may not even have a day shelter, don't quote me, but we may not even have a day shelter for homeless at a certain point in November for the first time I've known in seven, eight years. Thank you. If we could pass the... And if we could pass the mic back to Mr. Gass, he'll start our next question. Oh, Judy didn't go. Thanks. There's too many of you. All right, we'll start from the, this actually works well because then you can just pass it over. All right, Ms. Zingy. I guess if I was going to try and solve one issue, um, I'd look at housing. Uh, because I... I would look at it, I think, differently. We have Clinkett and Haida, KIC. Those folks have proven uh, they know how to get housing done. And for whatever reason, I don't feel we've reached out to them enough. I would like to see us do more government to government, um, take a look at what they're doing, how they're doing, how can we help with that? What can we bring to the table uh, to make this go a little faster? I find that at City Council, Things go on forever. Nine years I was there before I took a break. And I really don't feel that we got much accomplished. Um, and I would like to see us really focus on something and get it done. And I think we could do something with them and you know, work towards getting better housing. Okay. Thank you. 
now we'll start the next question. I think you're going <coughs> to start that one. Is she going to start that question then? I no, we're, we'll try to alternate who starts and who finishes. So we'll, we'll have Mr. Gasco first on this one. And um, all right, so what is the number one specific issue you believe needs to be tackled in the upcoming budgeting process that will start almost immediately after the election is over next week? So this is something I feel very strongly on. I think as we move forward into becoming more and more of a tourism town, whether we like it or not, we seem to be hitting record numbers after record numbers. I believe it was 1.5 million passengers this year. And we've had some of these discussions at the table, the, the, um, the head tax, the, the money we get from the cruise ships when they come here and use our port. As we all know, that's a very fought over issue and what we can do with that. They've been a little more lenient in recent years in allowing us to use some of that money for police and fire. But as we move forward uh, with these massive amounts of people who are using our roads, they're using our electricity, our water, our wastewater, all of our utilities, we need to really um, demand more in the, from them monetarily to help pay for these services that they use. Our people can't afford it. Uh, most of our utilities are in pretty bad shape, and they desperately need money, and it's a fair request. If we're going to totally let them take over our town half of the year darn near now, it's a, it's a reasonable expectation that they pay a little more. So more money from the ships. Thank you. Mr. Kristovich. Ask me one more time. Okay. Please. Uh, what is the number one specific issue that you believe needs to be ta uh, tackled in the upcoming budgeting process for the, the next fiscal year? The upcoming budget, the budget, yes. We need to um, look at what we got. Um, I'm hearing that this deferred maintenance on our port docks are now up to $60 million, if I heard right, $60 million. Uh, this has been going on before COVID when the city had money. Why wasn't this addressed? And it just kept getting put back, putting off, putting it off, putting off. Now we're looking at a huge bill. How much is left on the bonds that we took out at the taxpayer's expense to do the last port infrastructure repairs or whatever? How much is left there? We shouldn't take on any more debt until we can resolve what we have. We need to, the city needs to come to agreement with the unions I'm hearing that the unions are not in full, the city cannot come in full agreement with the unions. We need to pay these people. We have, there's problems with retaining employees or even recruiting people in this town to work for the city. We need to find ways to make this all happen. And we don't need to hire consultants for any more money. We could sit at the table, put our heads together and do it here locally with common sense. Thank you. Thank you. I want to bring up um, some things. Uh, specifically, the bond rating is at the bottom of our investment grade. Seventy percent of our bond is the hospital, 12 percent the fire station, and 9.4 is the library. Doing some research on the lease that we have with the hospital, um, within 2030, we, are, we have $27.2 million, $27 million in upgrades that we are going to share the cost in. So as I look at the budget and I see, and, and the things that we should have spent money on would have been our infrastructure. But now at the end of it, we have a $5 million bond up for a uh, vote. And I think that we need to focus on cutting costs, spending freezes, until we can figure out how we're going to pay for all this. I think that as we move into spending, uh, we are at odds because of these issues. It, it's not going to look pretty within the next five years, so I feel that I could help address that with some of the things I have. I'm going to borrow a little bit from Councilmember <clears throat> Bradbury here, excuse me, and um, talk about the importance of keeping our departments fully staffed. You know, we, we were facing a near shortage of, of CDL drivers in our waste department just last year and was getting near crisis levels and losing uh, the department, the head of the uh, pu public works department, Mark Hilson, to the private sector, I think indicates that the city needs to have competitive wages. Now, I know that personnel is an immense expense for the city. But if we are in a position where, as Ms. Bradbury had said, 
uh, in a place where we can't enact any of, the, any of the services that we'd like to put forward because we don't have the people in place because departments are short staffed, then we're not, we're not meeting the obligation that we have to our citizens. There are services that are expected, needed, and deserved. And if we don't have employees in place to put those services into effect, then we're not going to function as a city. So that would be one of my, fo that would be my primary focus in our next budget cycle. <laughs> I will go with my second um, <laughs> uh, priority. Um, we don't have a lot of funds. Everybody knows that. Um, I think we need to do a better job at prioritizing all of our capital projects and figuring out what are the most important ones, getting those t checked off the list, and other ones, if that's resurfacing a, um, a parking lot or buying excess vehicles because we have great deals or things like that. We need to really focus on what do we need. We need wastewater lines. We need water lines. We need to make sure that our water quality is top notch. We need to make sure on the uh, utility side that our fiber is good to go to continue keeping our community connected and also electric. Um, if we all want power and heat coming into the winter, we need to make sure that infrastructure is strong. So we really need to prioritize, not just in each department, but collectively in the city and then collectively in KPU and start uh, tackling our most critical structures. Our ports and harbors are our livelihood, our well-being of the city. This is our main bread and butter. This is where the seafood arrives. This is where our visitors arrive. Everything has to be looked into with the utmost importance. Uh, uh, total analysis of the all of what the decay is, the damage from the prop wash damage as well. Also, birth four is becoming an absolute nightmare. With it was only meant for three, four thousand people, and now there's over eight thousand people showing up because we have five more extra thousand people at birth five and six, so to say. And we really need to look at it before somebody actually could get hit by a bus, heaven forbid, or anything. We need to, things that we need to work on. Uh, we need to maybe get more crossing guards out there, or maybe community ambassadors, people that are friendly, show people how to ride a bus, get around general, where to go, and, and to keep looking forward as we are almost looking to become a world-class city because we have so many more visitors. And we really need to look at these concerns. Thank you. Thank you. If we could pass the mic back down this way to Ms. Zingy. I didn't forget you this time. Thank you. Um, I guess for me, one of the things that I would like to focus on in this budget is staffing. Uh, we've lost a tremendous amount of people, and I know that there are people at the city looking for jobs. It's not difficult anymore for um, people to find a better job than a city job. Um, there's plenty of them out there. We can have all the projects and all the jobs and everything lined up. Um, but if we don't have the people to do that work, and if we have people that aren't happy with their job, it's not going to get done. So we need to focus on that. I think we can be creative. Um, you know, I understand money's an issue, but I don't think it's the only issue. I think we can look at doing some creative things with our employees and maybe listen to them and see what it is that they want and help move that forward. Thank you. Ms. Rolson, if you'll close out this question for us. So um, to address the budget issue, um, we need money. That's basically what we do, or what we need. And I think we need to put a lot more emphasis into federal grant writing. Um, there's a lot of money out there, especially from Biden's Infl Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act, um, that I think the city hasn't tapped into. I really think that if we can acquire these grants from the federal government, then a lot of the money that we're seeking for projects that could be used, um, like the water, uh, the show and bar uh, water project that replace the pipes and everything, um, a lot of that we can get from grant funding if we just have the people writing grants to petition for the government. Thank you, and if you can pass the mic to Mr. Kristovich, and he'll start our next question. And uh, you guys need to stop answering questions before I ask them, but we'll dive into this one a little bit more. <laughs> the city has extensive and expensive deferred maintenance liabilities and capital improvement requirements. How should the council practically 
tackle planning and paying for these items. Okay, so how much bond money is left to repay for the drive down dock at Bar Harbor, the double lane launch ramp? How much debt is left to be paid for the port, the hospital? Um, we've, we've, we've wasted money over the years. Uh, within a year, last year, we hired a new port and director, port and harbors director, excuse me. He resigned suddenly. I don't know why. So, at what cost did it cost? Did it, at what cost to the city was his severance package, if there was one? We've gone through, I can tell you, at least three police officers within the last four years, and it cost the city $220,000 from the academy into a patrol car per officer, and we lost three. Can't pay them, there's, there's better money. I'm hearing that the city of Juneau's paying $11 an hour more, plus a $30,000 $30, signing bonus. Looks pretty attractive if you don't have any family ties here, and you know if if you can't make it here, we have to make it feasible because these are the people that provide our public safety and they protect us and amongst other things. So we have to get time, get things in order here, and prioritize our spending and funding. Thank you. Thank you. Starting with. Uh, what we've had is a lot of costs. The costs are going up. Pension, solid waste, liability, property, auto, heating up 123%. So all the costs are going up. So how do we pay for deferred maintenance? I think that the, if we're talking about having employees come and, and want to be a part of our community, I think that they need to be drawn here. One of the ways that I'm, I'm saying is we need to cut taxes. We need to offer incentives to builders so that they can come into the town, that it would create more, more visibility for our community. If we don't have a vibrant community where there's no housing and there's, you know, depressed wages and there's also things, there's inflation that's eating up the dollar. So how do we get people here? We, hit, we build affordable housing. We have the builders cut uh, the taxes and they will come. But to, to build, you have to have money. And I think that without some form of a tax break to our citizens, then that is gonna be a problem. I think it's important to remember that the council members typically aren't experts in the fields that the various departments are addressing. And the best we can really do as a council is to make the best informed decision available with the information that's presented to us. And it's kind of unfortunate timing that the municipal election happens right before the budget cycle because for me as a first time seated council member, getting thrown into the budget vortex, it was a lot to take on. However, I was struck by the candor with which the department heads in their presentations to the council would be very candid about how to prioritize which projects they were asking us to fund. Now, obviously they want to get as many dollars for the department as possible. They have long wish lists, but for the most part, they were flexible in saying, look, this is something that we need, this is something that we'd like. And having candid conversations with the experts in those departments is going to help us as a council prioritize which projects are achievable in the future and in, with the budget that we've got. I slightly answered this one on my previous one, so I'll continue on to that. Um, I want to piggyback off of um, Judy Zini's comment earlier about partnerships amongst others. Um, we, we can't do a lot of these things on our own, and so I do think we have a lot of community partners that have a little bit more expertise and a little bit more funding options um, than the city. So I think definitely partnering is that with the borough, KIC, Klinka and Haida, um, cruise lines, whatever, whoever that partner is in the area that we need, um, especially for deferred maintenance, trying to figure out how we can move forward with MOUs and work a little bit closer with those other organizations that have access to way more funding than we do in our town. I have researched into f possible federal funding for substance abuse issues that are called recovery cafes. There may be that, as well as we really need to have emphasis on OPP, other people's money, caring, concerned community members, organizations, businesses, corporations that can help donate materials, donate time, other things such as that. 
as well as for the housing. When we had a group of ladies who showed up uh, here doing research with the city for housing, they mentioned that there's people out there in other parts of the state that can get reimbursed for the building. And we need to patch up these loopholes and see what we're missing here and we, so that we don't have to use much of our own money at all. It's a lot more out there, I feel, firmly believe my research, than we ever think. And I apologize to the community. I must leave early. I have important business to attend to, and I value everybody. Thank you. I hope for your vote. If we could pass the mic back down this way, please. Thank you. Ms. Zingy. Uh, well, I agree with um, Mr. Finnegan and um, with Ms. Bradbury. I think the council doesn't have the expertise in all these fields. I think it is important that we reach out to other community members. Um, I specific, I would like to see us do more um, with the tribes and do more government to government uh, MOUs and work with them. Um, other than that, I think we prioritize what we can fund and, um, you know, look at, for the, at the state and feds to, for some additional funding to help with those things. So to prioritize uh, these projects, definitely we want to speak to the department heads and they have an idea of what projects are most important that we need to address right away. For the funding of it, like I said earlier, um, state and federal grant are, is going to be our, our, our big meal ticket there. All alternative to that, I think that we need to really look at alternative economic avenues that can provide a cash flow all year round and not just half the year. Uh, that's a problem that we're, we dealt with when COVID hit is when the ships were gone, there was no money. So we need to figure out a way that we can bring other industries into Ketchikan that we can have a year round revenue stream. Just like Timber's got a second win now in Alaska. We need to be looking at those industries and others um, that can bring revenue year round instead of just one time a year. So I touched on this on the last question, but uh, number one answer to repeat it is more money from the ships. I mean, we're getting more and more tourists every year. As I said, they're using all of our stuff. They need to pay a little more. Um, but more broadly, I think it's a call to the council to a serious wake up call that we need to tighten our belts. We need to realize the situation we're in, that our citizens cannot bear to keep going into this debt that we seem to be taking on. We need to stop the spending. We need to, we need to identify what our key services that we must provide are and no longer add anything for the foreseeable future. You know, in the last year, we've added two come to mind new positions just recently. Unfortunately, both of those were voted in favor of. I voted against them. But we have to ask ourselves, where's the money going to come from on these? Um, one thing I'd like to highlight, too, is I did draft a local preference hiring policy last year, which I think will be a small drop in the bucket when we have qualified local folks applying for jobs. Rather than spending all that money to bring people from across the country, which we so often do that don't often pan out, uh, we should look local. Thanks. Everything that they said, I'm in total agreement with. Um, you're, when it comes to prioritizing I, funding. I hate to interrupt, but I think you actually started this question. I did. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's OK. That's OK. All right. I mean, we could spend a long time talking about deferred maintenance, but all right. Uh, Mr. Arnold, you'll start us next. Um, very straightforward question. Do you believe that Ward Cove should be annexed by the city and why? Yes, I believe uh, that's one of my plans is to annex part of uh, Ward Cove. I think we can carve out parts of it so we don't put an excess burden on the residents out there. But I live on Shoreline. I wanted to say in the beginning that uh, Robert Spath was one of the guys that w went to war and came back, and I live on Spath and Shoreline. So I want to follow in his footsteps. We also, we don't have any sewer or water on our road. So no one seems to be having a problem with that, although it would be nice to have. We can carve out parts of uh, Ward Cove for excess more revenue coming into the city. Because the problem is, is if you keep spending at the same rate and not bringing in more money, then the thing's going to explode, and then people are really going to be out of work, and then the city's really going to be in disrepair, and then the potholes are going to get bigger. 
we can't have that. We have to have a vision. We, have to, we can't live in the future. We can't live in the past. We have to do things now. Now is the time. You know, my work as a uh, tour guide and charter fishing captain, uh, you get peppered with a lot of questions. And I, I, think it's a, I think it's a good value to say that you don't know when you don't know. And this is one of those questions that I don't have the answer to. Not because I, I wouldn't form an opinion, but it's something that I've only heard discussed anecdotally. It's not something that I've studied. It's not something that I've considered seriously. I mean, as, as a gut feeling, um, I, I don't know. The, the needle kind of leans like 55, 45, no. But that's not based on anything other than the anecdotal discussions I've had. So I can't give you a clear answer on that, but it is something, if, if there were a serious discussion to be had about that, uh, there would have to be a lot of conversations held with a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of research and analysis would have to be done before I could determine from my own view whether it would be beneficial to the city and the city's residents at large. Um, it, this one's a hard one. Um, would it be nice to annex out a little bit further to collect that revenue? Yes, that, of course, it's money. But in the reality of it, we can't even take care of the people who currently reside in the city um, in terms of wastewater and water. So I just feel like if we were to expand into that area, um, it, it's really for no purpose to the community and the uh, individuals that actually live out there. Um, it's also extremely expensive to annex, and we don't have any money for anything inside the city right now. So why would we... Um, try to conquer that uh, currently. Sure. And actually, we can come back along this way. So if you want to go, Mr. Kristovich, and then we'll come back this way. Annex Ward Cove? Absolutely not. That, the city limits have always ended before Ward Cove, and that's where it should lie. They got Ward Cove. They got a new port. It's privately owned. Leave it alone. Let them make the money. The borough is in a lot better shape than the city is right now. We could probably learn a lot from them. We can't fix what we have. It's been going on for years. Tourism is the mainstay of our economy. After tourism season, things slow down. So do not annex Ward Cove. Where are you going to get the money to put the services in? Just like Rob said, we don't have services in Shoreline. So that happened. The annexation of Shoreline Drive happened when Walmart opened over 12 years ago. I had plenty of time before COVID to do stuff. Nothing's been done. Thank you. So as tempting as it would be uh, to just push those sea limits out just a hair more, as I believe the sea limits actually come essentially to the very start of Ward Cove, uh, and as tempting as it would be as a city person to uh, get all that tax revenue, I am against it more on a basis of principle. Um, for one, I'd be afraid that if we did get additional revenue coming in from Ward Cove, that we have a bad habit of spending more. So I wouldn't want that temptation. But on a, on a, on a practical note, I don't think it's right, because the folks at Ward Cove, they're in the free market. They're not the government. They saw an opportunity for an investment. They took an enormous amount of risk. They did their own thing. And my hat goes off to them for it. Uh, the city does not get as much tax revenue now because of it. But I don't believe in punishing them with the burden of more government because they were able to successfully create a business uh, opportunity there. So my answer is no. Uh, echoing previously said, answers uh no i wouldn't annex ward cove um ward cove itself is a privately owned entity out there for, for their business venture and i i just think that if they're going to have their cruise line ports out there that they need to designate that as ward cove alaska it's in its own zip code not ketchikan alaska that's what a lot of them say is like oh you're going to ketchikan when the passengers come in downtown like oh we were going to ketchikan but we got dropped off by the junkyard like so, so unknowing to them, they think like, oh, I've been on this trip, you know, 10 times coming up on Norwegian cruise lines. And then like, oh, I'm not where I thought I was going to be. So I just think that we should change, they should change the wording of where the ships are going to go. Um, that would be for Ward Cove and maybe um, address some of the um, issues that their traffic does provide or does uh, impact on um, coming into town but yeah not not don't don't annex it well i'll give us back some time here because uh no i i don't think we should annex ward cove we annexed shoreline we gave them nothing for it 
So to me, it's a cash grab. So no. Okay, okay. and uh, we'll actually enter our previously aforementioned lightning speed dating round for candidates. We're going to ask a series of yes or no questions. And you cannot say maybe. You must say yes or no, and you're not allowed to explain your answer. That is for the community to come and ask for more details. All right, so we'll start. Judy, you have the, you have the microphone, so we'll, we'll start with you and just go down the table. Um, should the city consider selling KPU telecoms as it has considered in prior years? Yes or no? No. No. Yes. 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 No. No. Okay. And Abby, we'll start with you. Do you support the existing process the council uses to provide funding to nonprofit agencies and organizations? No. Yes. No. Ask me one more time, please. Do you support the existing process the council uses to provide funding support to nonprofit agencies and organizations? No, okay. not right now. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Uh, you have the microphone. We'll just keep going along like this. Uh, do you support the implementation of rent controls within the city of Ketchikan? No. No. Heck no. Can't be done. No. Absolutely not. No. The theme is no. <laughs> okay. Um, moving right along, do you support consolidation of the city and the borough? <laughs> yes or no? No, no explanation. Yes I'm sorry, but not really. <laughs> um, and I only can say no. Or <coughs> For safety, no, because it needs to be explained. No. <laughs> no. Nope. No. 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 Do you support the idea of limiting or capping the number of cruise ship passengers coming into our community? No. No. Yes. Absolutely yes. 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 Okay. Well, that didn't go the way I thought it would. So <laughs> even I even I can be surprised. <laughs> um should the city and KPU be separated so that the two entities are structured and managed independently of one another? Yes. No. Absolutely yes. 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 No. Okay. And sticking with that theme, if they weren't separated out, but would you support having a separate elected body that oversees KPU instead? Yes or no? Yes. No. No. Yes. Yes. No. Elected body? Yes. Or no. By the people? C correct. Yes. No, it's you. You've got a point. <laughs> All right. Make sure it was the citizens. Yes. Yes. Just like the council would be. Be elected at large by the citizens of the city. Uh, do you support the implementation of limits on short-term rentals within the city? No. No. Could you say that again? Do you support the implementation of limits on short-term rentals within the city? No like limit. Airbnb? No limits. No. Nope. nope. No. No. Last one for this is, do you support transitioning the library to the borough to be performed as an area-wide function? No. Yes. Yes. Can you define your question a little bit? Yes. Would you support? 
<laughs> um, transitioning management, oversight, and control and ownership of the Ketchikan Public Library from the city to the borough? No. Yes. No. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, since we have, that went by way quicker than I thought it would, because you guys actually kept it to yes or no, and I appreciate, I appreciate you. I know, I appreciate you playing within the, the limits of, that, I, uh, that I gave you. Um, so who has, who has the microphone? Who hasn't started a question yet? Mr. Finnegan. I have not. Um, let's dive in to the idea of limiting or capping the number of cruise ship passengers coming into our community. I'll give each of you a minute to answer that question. Okay, so we're just discussing this broadly? Yes. Okay. That's my lead-in? Yep, that's your lead-in. That's my lead-in. Okay. I know that this is something that I don't, I don't think previously there was an appetite for a discussion like this, and I think, I don't know that anybody anticipated the kind of growth that we've seen. I know that it's incredibly important to our local economy, but there's also a quality of life concern that's seriously worth considering. Finding the right balance between what we can provide to people who visit this place and what the residents of this place need for good happy, healthy, supported lives is a critical question that is going to come before the council. And if, if answering that question entails setting a limit on the number of ships or the size of ships or the number of people that can come into our community, it's absolutely a conversation worth having. It's a question worth examining. And we wouldn't have to be the tip of the spear. Bar Harbor, Maine has already implemented limitations of this kind, and we can see in the years to come what the impact has been for them both as a community and as a local economy. And it's not the only example, but I'm almost out of time. So at least we'd have some examples to give us some, uh, some idea of how that might function. Um, I <clears throat> definitely believe we need to uh, have that conversation. We have other communities in Alaska and the US and other parts of the world that are capping based on ship, ship size, or a yearly amount. Uh, I personally do not agree with that because I feel like that still allows for days where we are overwhelmed with thousands and thousands of more people than we can actually handle. So if uh, we were to implement something um, in terms of a cap, I would like to see a daily cap of amount of passengers that come to the downtown dock. Um, I don't care if they come on a 5,000 passenger ship or if they come on a 200 passenger ship. This is the amount of people that we know we can handle in our community and it's balanced well for the locals um, to still do what they want to do during the day. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. So I did say a cap, but what I meant was cap, I believe in capitalism, that it's the f purest form of democracy. People spend or vote with their dollar bills. I think that if conditions continue the way they are, we will have a self-limiting cap because people from some of the reviews I saw, uh, it was pretty bad. The, the one lady at Ward Cove said, oh, it looks like we got dumped off at a garbage dump and that uh, we get no time and then they shove us around and, and we, we have limited places. To, so I think that we're, we're going to limit ourselves. People will not want to come here if we continue to have the problems that we have with, over, with no workers to, to help them with uh, congested roads with huge potholes. So I think that we need to start fixing our infrastructure but we need to also have workers and we you know there's ways that we can do that right now i mean the city can spend money right now they can buy trailers and bring them in or right behind the marine there's a marine view there's a big church that's been for sale forever they can convert those into housing other towns like anchorage is using motels they're refurbishing for for um apartments so there's ways that we could make it more attractive and that's it, time <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Would you like me to repeat the question? No. Okay. To, put, to, put a, to put a cap on passengers, yes. Um, we're, we're running out of room. Uh, with more people, we're going to have to make the roads bigger or whatever, but we're running out of room to develop anything. S and if we get any more people, we won't have oxygen to breathe pretty much. And it's just, it's going to be maddening. It's maddening enough to try and get through traffic. Um, the, we, ha we do have a shortage of crossing guards. Years ago, and you're going to read about this in the paper, I mentioned to a city council member at the time, we got a problem beyond Main Street. We need more crossing guards around the corner of the federal building. That's a bad corner. Somebody's going to get it there. Um, we had an accident today. 
person got ran over in the lighted crosswalk at A&P. And from what I read on social media, it was a tour vehicle. I'm not picking on the tour industry, but it was sad that it happened. I was part of the citizens group that got those stoplights. I was part of that working group that we got those stoplights in place and some of these speed reading signs. We need more of this for public safety to protect not just ourselves, but the summer visitors. And um, so yeah, putting a cap on it, see how things work and go from there. Thank you. So this topic got brought up during the cruise ship shutdown of the COVID times and I was opposed to the even looking into it at that time because we had zero passengers. As everyone is aware, we are now at a million and a half-ish passengers, and it is a totally different situation. So at this time, I am in favor of looking into that. I think, um, you know, I'm also a citizen. I try to get through town. I have the same frustrations as everyone else. And I also wanted to add, we have to listen to the people. The people have spoken very loudly on this issue through community surveys and in other ways. People are saying, this is too much. And I think as an elected representative, it's our duty to listen to them and, and hear them out. Uh, I do want to add, we also got kind of a, a presentation from uh, uh, Southeast Stevedoring last year about this issue. And just so folks know, there's a lot that goes into it with the scheduling, with the ships. They were very uneasy about even talking about it, so there's a lot that goes into it, but I think we do need to start going down that road with a daily limit. Thank you. Um, I am not in favor of limiting right now uh, because we don't have any other revenue stream. So we're always talking about we don't have enough money for the budget, we don't have enough money for this, we don't have enough money for that. Well, if you cut back the passengers that bring in the money, then you're going to keep saying, we don't have enough money, but you want to limit the industry that you have. So what you need to do is you need to look at other alternate economic drivers that are going to bring money into Ketchikan so we can limit the amount of passengers here. So we have that cash buffer to say, you know what, it's OK if we limit how many are coming in per year or how many per day because we have money to tide us over. But if we just cut it off and say, this is how much it is, we're always going to keep asking, where are we going to get more money? Where are we going to get more money? We need to really think about where that money's going to come from. Um, I said no, uh, and that's because I don't think we're ready for that right now. I think there's other things that we can look at. We don't do a very good job of moving people around in this community. They all seem concentrated in one area. I think there's room to spread some of that out. We just um, hired a tourism development, oh, I think they called it something else. I wanted it to be called development, but y'all didn't do that. <laughs> and so, because I feel we need to look at this from 10,000 feet above and take a look at how we're doing things and not just automatically, I mean, we're really good at doing those quick fixes and then finding out they don't work and they end up costing us more money. So I think we really need to take a careful look at this because this is our livelihood. This is where we make our money and we need to do a better job of focusing on how we're going to do that. Down the road, if after everything is said, you all come up and say we need to limit it, okay, let's do it. But I don't think we've really looked at everything yet appropriately to make that decision. Time. Okay, and if we, thank you. And if we could pass all the way down to Abby, she can start our next question. And then we'll work backwards from there like we've been doing. Uh, the council is responsible for the governance of the city while management is the function of our professional staff. How would you as a council member work to maintain that balance and distinction between the two roles? Can, can you repeat it one more time? Yes. The council is responsible for the governance of the city while management is the function of the professional staff, day-to-day -day management. How would you as a council member work to maintain that balance and distinction between the two roles? So first and foremost, according to our charter, um, ev that the number one person in charge of management is a city manager unless uh, the citizens seek appeal on any um, one topic. So I'll start with there. But uh, we also have policies in place. Uh, we are a policy uh, making body. And so we need to focus more on policy and ensuring that our funds are spent accordingly and respect the citizens' uh, tax dollars that are going into those. Uh, so the, I think for the most part, um, anytime 
I, well, my three years there have been a couple times that uh, that line has been blurred, but I think for the most part, um, I've been very vocal about policy and ensuring that um, policies are brought forward versus just making um, decisions. So. Uh, one thing Councilmember Bradbury said there about um, focusing on policy, I think that's obviously that's the role of the council out of the gate, uh, but also avoiding running interference on a department. You know, I spoke earlier about trusting the people that are in the departments who are working there for being the experts in those fields. And if, if we see a policy change that might better the services that they're providing or better serve the residents of this community, then we should focus on the policy change and make that. You know, I, I strangely, I like it when council decisions stick to the relatively mundane. You know, when we're, when we're making informed decisions based on the information that's been presented to us by staff, and weighing whether or not it's in the best interest for the residents at large, I think that's where the council does its best work. When we start running interference on how a department is run, that's where I think we put ourselves into a, a bad spot. I'd like to stay out of there if we can. I think it's a symbiotic relationship between the manager and the city council. Um, I think right now the city council or the managers doing way too much. They're the managing the city and then they're managing KPU, which I don't see how that's possible. I think it needs to change. The manager should be just managing the city. The other thing that I've noticed in the past, it seems like the manager was controlling everything. So you had an imbalance. We and I think some of these problems of you know, the bonds and, you know, all this spending happened because it was kind of a, out of control. So we need a balance. We need balanced government. We also need the government uh, city council to listen to the taxpayers in the town. If the, ta the taxpayers have an issue, then the city council needs to address that and let the manager do their job. But our job is to hear what the people have to say. I pretty much was going to say what Rob said, um, but yes, there there are decisions and stuff. So the the manager takes direction from the council. So we got to be sensible sensible about this, level headed, come up with some good ideas. Um, yes, uh, the one one person doing two two department jobs is overwhelming. Um, they should have never done that, uh, in my opinion. So when you you have to make decisions that are fair and equitable, you got to listen to the citizens, which I do. I get a lot of people telling me stuff, calling me on the phone with concerns or complaints. So we got to take that into consideration. And if there's things that need to be put in place, if there's something that uh, um, affects the community where we have to change a ordinance or a policy or something, then we should do it. So um, you have to you have to really think about things. Um, there, there's going to always be good. There's always going to be bad. You're not going to make the right si decision that pleases everybody, but that's the way it is. Sometimes you just have, there's the haves and the haves not. So um, you just got to really use some common sense on a lot of things. Thank you. So I agree that focusing on, pol on policy is uh, at the top of our list on the council uh, for how we do our operations. I think Another important thing for us to keep in mind on the council is we are supposed to be the voice of the people. Uh, when the citizens vote for who and how they want their government ran, they only have a say in the mayor and the council. They are who are elected. Um, st the council is to hire the manager, and that is how that relationship works. And sometimes it can be a fine line, but I do think it's very important that the council listens to the will of the people. Char um, 2 4 Part 4 of the Ketchikan Charter does state that the council powers shall have authority to inquire into the conduct of any office, department, or agency of the city and investigate affairs. That's kind of a broad statement, but I think it's important to understand that and walk that fine line without crossing it. Thank you. Uh, just like Abby said about the charter, the city council should focus on policy. We hired a city manager to manage the departments. Unless there's public outcry on an issue or um, some type of problem that the city manager isn't addressing, then the council, you know, could step in a little bit. But but we hired a city manager to do the job. Us micro city council micromanaging that 
position isn't going to help anybody. It's not going to make the departments better. It's not going to make the decisions of the city manager because then, it's walk then she'd be walking on eggshells every day. What am I going to do if it's, you know, if it's not going to be good enough for the council, if they're going to step in and change and override what I'm doing? Um, if we're hiring somebody who's doing a good job so far, what I've seen, uh, I think that people need to understand that the manager is the manager and the council is the council. I think we need to stay in our own lane as a council. Yes, we should um, address policy. We, the employees that we have is the manager, the attorney, and the city clerk. I think if we have issues with the department heads that we hire, then we should deal with those through the manager. If we're not happy with the manager, then you know that's another issue. We spend a lot of money hiring professional people with knowledge that we don't have to run those departments. And I think if we don't have confidence in their ability to do that, then we need to discuss that with the manager. Um, I, I agree, listening to the public is basically why we're elected. Um, and if we have, if they come to us with issues, we absolutely should put it on the agenda. But we also should understand what our role is once we do that. Thank you. And you can hang on to the microphone. We're all the way. We came full circle. So <clears throat> uh, sticking on the subject of policy, programmatic issues aside, talking about the library and that process, if there were anything with regard to the library or any department for that matter regarding citizen appeals, appeals of a man the manager's decision or a department head, would you have changed the way that whole process played out? What would you do differently? What could be done to ensure something like that doesn't necessarily cause the kind of controversy it caused earlier this year? I know that's a pretty broad stroke question, and so it's what it means to you, because it's a matter of policy. And so, Judy, you can, you can start us off. Well, I think we have, uh, with many of our departments, right, we have uh, advisory boards. And they are the citizens in our community. They are the people that we should be listening to. So if we're not happy with what they bring forward, then maybe we should look at the board. But again, I think we have to start trusting the people that we put in those positions. And the whole controversy with the library, I didn't view that as a council decision. I just didn't. I felt that. It was the department's decision. It was the librarian's decision. Um, and, a, and it was a personal family decision whether you wanted to participate. Um, if we're talking about the book or the drag queen story time is what I think we're talking about. Um, to me, that was a family decision. If you didn't want to participate, then don't go. But I think that what they decided as a library, library advisory board should have been respected, and as well as the librarian herself. So uh, I definitely think that we, the community plays a part in the, like Judy said, the advisory board. And it's not the council's, I think, the council's place to step in and override um, another governing body in that sense. If there is an issue with policy being made by one of the committees that oversees um, an area, then it's up to the citizens to recall that person, that's with the, the people that are on their board, and to change the people that are making those policy decisions. Um, so yeah. Thank you for the question. So on, with regards to this issue, um, where we had a issue was the current, or the, I should say the former policy, because we did end up changing it after this situation, but the former policy was uh, seen to be open-ended in that it ended with the librarian and the library advisory board whose job is to advise the librarian. Um, the folks who, many, many folks who were um, offering complaints about the uh, pornographic material in the youth section or the teen section of the library, their frustration was that the library advisory board and the librarian, they did not feel were taking their concerns to heart. So what we actually did to try to make a policy going forward to fix this issue was we added an addendum, I believe, 
is the way to say it, to the policy that it ends with the council. When citizens vote for people, they only vote for the council and the mayor. They don't vote for the library advisory board. The library advisory board members are chosen by the mayor and approved by the council. So I think we fixed, we did a step in the right direction to fix an issue that wasn't, uh, well, that's all I have, thanks. Thank you. You're gonna read it to me one more time. Oh, I don't have that one written okay. down. Uh, okay, so we're talking about the library. So last year, this was a hot topic when I was campaigning. Everybody, what are you going to do about the library problem? We wouldn't be talking about this right now if we had to use common sense. They have an event every month I th or once in a while in a private location, coffee with a queer. That's fine. Nobody's raising a big stink about it. Nobody's going to Tonga's Federal pulling their money out of the bank because they allow that in their, in, their, in their venue area. That's fine. It works. We could have moved that there. If the, if the venue area cost money, charge a couple of bucks. That whole situation divided our community. It divided our government. It created a civil war. So I'm glad that they, they addressed this. They solved it. They've changed some policies. But... You use common sense, we won't have these problems. And it doesn't take that long and it doesn't cost any money. You don't have to hire a consultant, you don't have to run any studies. You just put your heads together, come up with a simple solution. I always look at the worst thing and then we go from there and it comes out good. Thank you. From a governance standpoint, I think that there were many issues and it was a red herring, the whole thing. I mean, we have so many things that are going on with the city that this issue came up. But from what I saw, because I attended some of the advisory meetings, um, and also the process in which the person is put on that advisory, I think the mayor decides. Um, from what I saw from the, uh, from the public's point of view, that there were a lot of people that were against that particular book. But it didn't seem like it w made any difference to the head librarian, who's under the city manager. As far as the board goes, I feel like there should be equal representation. It seemed like a certain point of view was on that board predominantly. And the one person, I've talked to the one person that's on that board, she she feels like she, her voice does not matter. In fact, she's ridiculed. I saw some her being ridiculed and sidelined. I also saw, which was weird, because I've been on a lot of boards, and like you don't have who's ever the director of the library being telling the board what to do in the procedure. She was out of order. The librarian was telling the board, no, you can't talk about that. No, you can't do this. It's like, excuse me, but the board runs their meeting and the librarian is just there for a report or whatever. So I think that we need to, to find out what's going on here. And the, the governance structure of that whole advisory board needs to be looked at by the city. And uh, there's that some weird time. stuff going on. Sorry, uh, if I recall, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> if I recall, Mr. Well. Shaw's uh, question on the topic it was whether I feel that the policy that's in place needs further revision, and I do not. There is a robust appeals process if we're speaking specifically to the library, and I, I've been serving on the library advisory board as the city council representative to that board. Uh, it's delineated in the um, the bylaws of the uh, or in the. Uh, in the ordinances uh, relating to the library, as Mr. Gass mentioned, we further refined that policy. There's a step-by-step -step process that individuals can take, and I feel that with the additional refinement that was made by the council, the policy that's in place uh, is is pretty robust, and um, it's, it's, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Um, like was mentioned, we have um, changed the current um, appeals process, and I believe the current one is a great structure. Um, our citizens can come to the podium and add an agenda item. It can be any agenda item that they want. Why can't they appeal to us about a way, um, a department or uh, a program that or a book that's going on the, the um, library at KPU, um, any department, if they had an issue with the manager, I mean, they could bring it forward. The citizens have that right. Um, and I feel like our uh, previous appeals process was not 
Um, didn't fall in line with that either. So I'm happy with the current one, not planning on changing that, but um, I do like, or I would like to change the advisory um, boards and how those programs work. Advisory boards are strictly there to advise. They are not there to make decisions. They aren't elected by the citizens. Um, that is where the management and the council um, does step in. So I, that line is important. Thank you. Yeah, if you want, if you can, you can hold on to it, and we'll we'll work our way backwards. Um, we're we're getting short on time. Thank you all for bearing with us, and um, I won't make you endure as long as I did the assembly candidates. We kept them here for a very long time, and yes, I did hear about that. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead, and we can do closing statements. And so, Miss Bradbury, if you want to kick us off, um, one minute each closing statement. Um, yeah, uh, again, just thank you. Um, the most important thing at this election is that everybody gets out to vote no matter who you vote for. Um, if you want to say and who represents you at the table, please get out and vote on the third. It is very important. That's the only way that you can seek change if you want to see change. So please get out and vote. Um, if you cast your vote for me, I'll continue to do what I've been doing, um, advocating for the community in the community and also outside. Um, I just recently was at Southeast Conference talking to the federal and state level, um, trying to bring more resources to our community. Um, I'll continue to do that um, if elected. Thank you. One of the guiding principles by which I try to live my life is a sense of stewardship. Uh, that goes with how I treat this planet that we live on. It's, it's our home, but it's not my home forever. And like Councilmember Gass, I have a child under one, and my thoughts about the future are profoundly altered by my recognition of the future that my child will face. On Monday, we had our forum with the uh, senior government students at Ketchikan High School, and it was enthralling to see the level of uh, engagement that those kids have, the sense of... Uh, connection they have to, their to our community, the concerns that they've got about our future, and to hear from them about the things that they are thinking about, that they are concerned about, changes that they would like to see, was invigorating for me and a reminder that we are, we are stewards to this place. And that is part of what figures into my thinking when I help make decisions at the council. I really want to create the best future for our community and for our kids. So I ask for your vote. Thank you. I'd like to offer you commitment, passion, and leadership. I feel that we're at a crossroads. We've been to the past, and the past has given us all these bills, so we need to pay them. We need to come up with innovative ways to create revenue. I believe in a balanced approach. Uh, I'm a balanced person. I like to listen to both sides of things before I make a decision. I think that we're unbalanced right now, and the teeter-totters fallen down. So bringing it up, let's get on equal ground. Let's stop spending and start listening to our constituents. Vote for me on October 3rd. Well, I'd like to say that uh, living here almost 57 years, this town has really changed. And I've seen it from when Logging and fishing was the mainstay here. We had a good, safe community. The money stayed here. It was pretty much all local. All the downtown stores were all locally run. We had a pretty good thing going. And then tourism grew. Property owners squeezed the rent. We lost all these local merchants. More came in. Uh, there was concern before we had too many jewelry stores come to town. The public went to city council meetings. We need to put a moratorium on them. Fell on deaf ears. Well, we got what we got. And not everybody wants to get off the ship and buy expensive jewelry. Um, I shop locally. I encourage people, you know, where to go to local stores and others and stuff um, to kind of retain a little bit of local pride. You know, go to these stores, shop locally, and stuff like that. We got a mess to clean up. I'm, I got a strong back and I got a lot of shovels and a couple of wheelbarrows, so please vote for me. I listen to you. I'll take your comments and advisement. If we can take it to the table and get it passed, let's do it. Thank you. Well, I haven't been here quite as many years as Mr. Christrich, and my back's not quite as strong, but I've also been born and raised here, and I 
as I said earlier, I have a, a new young daughter. I plan to spend the rest of my life here. I love it here. And uh, I want to I want to work to make this place a safe, affordable, welcoming place for people to continue to raise their families here. I'm asking for your vote on October 3rd because I think I bring a unique perspective, a unique perspective to the table. Um, there's just a disconnect. I hear from the citizens when I'm out working, when I'm out in the community, there's a real disconnect that emerges between elected folks in this town and the rest of the community. And people are just saying, enough is enough with the spending. We got to get that under control. So that's going to be my main focus if I'm fortunate enough to get reelected. And uh, I commit to working hard, showing up, not always taking the popular thing, but doing what I always believe is right. And uh, I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for being here today and being invited to this uh, forum. I really think that I'm going to bring something different to the table with my perspective on how are we going to have a year-round revenue. So we, as a council member, I would be supporting and looking at other uh, alternative revenue sources, not just our seasonal, so that we can change how our summer season is handled. And if we want to limit the number of passengers, we can do that. But we need to have the funding and able to change our current revenue stream. So um, with your support, I really hope that I can make positive change to make the lives of people better here. Thank you. Um, I believe Ketchikan is a beautiful place to live. Together, we need to start pulling on the rope in the same direction, compromise where it makes sense, and hold our ground when necessary. Shore up what we need and stop funding what doesn't work. I believe I'm the right choice in this election, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. I can take that. I know. I'll have that if you please. <laughs> I'll have it if you don't. Um, October 3rd. Municipal elections, six days, polls are open seven days. Whoa, you shouldn't have given it to me. <laughs> no, that, no, it rolled. Anyway, October 3rd, six days, next Tuesday. Uh, polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Early voting is open at your clerk's office. Early in-person absentee voting open at your clerk's office Monday through Friday. Um, yeah, we have our local elections, which are the school board, city council, borough assembly. Please encourage your friends, family to vote. And we'll close out by giving a round of applause to our city council candidates. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>